Welcome everyone to the first uh, seminar for the Commercial Law Centre for uh, this academic year. Uh, I'm Parker Hood, I'm one of the co-directors along with Longi Liu. Um, we are delighted to have Mark Moore from University College London coming to speak with us and equally delighted that our chair, uh, Lady Wolf, um, will uh, be in charge of proceedings today. Uh, so I'm very happy to hand over to uh, Lady Wolf, who will introduce the speaker more fully uh, and appropriately. And then uh, Mark will speak. We'll have a discussion uh, after that. So uh, Lady Wolf, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Parker. Well, good afternoon. Oh, oh one more thing. Um, can we turn the mics off, please? And if you're having problem with connection, Google Chrome is better. Sorry, sorry, Lady Wolf, I will, I will now cease speaking for the rest of the time. Not at all. And uh, that's a good advice to, uh, to mute um, until we get to the question and answer session. Uh, and then there's a chat function to raise hands for any question, and that will be moderated. But it is my very great pleasure to um, kick off the first of the um, autumn seminars in the Edinburgh Centre for Commercial Law and we have an absolutely stellar start with that of Professor Mark Moore, um, who will be speaking on curtailing contractual wriggle out in the shadow of COVID. So I think this is the first of the presentations in the academic year of 2021. I think this may also be the first presentations done by an online digital platform. But happily, this is not the first time that Professor Mark has spoken to uh, Professor Mark Moore has spoken to. Um, the center and uh, he's given a, a previous um, talk which was very well received. Um, I think since then he has uh, achieved even greater academic eminence. Um, for a while he um, did his first degree in Glasgow and we'll forgive him for that and uh, then moved on to do a doctorate and then his educational career in London uh, or in, in England rather. We, most recently he's been appointed to the chair of corporate and financial law at UCL, and that was last year. Prior to that, he was the reader in corporate law and MCL director at the University of Cambridge. He had had a previous stint at UCL there as well. He has been the winner of a number of, of prizes. And if one looks at his uh, bibliography, he has an exceptionally um, interesting uh, list of, of, of uh, articles that he's produced. Uh, and uh, I would commend you to to look at at some of those. It makes me envious at uh, at the opportunity I've asked to write on such subjects as he has, and with such verve and ability. So, without further ado, I give you um, uh, Professor Mark Moore on curtailing contractual wriggle out in the shadow of COVID. Professor Moore. Th thank you, Sarah, for that incredibly kind introduction. Uh, quite an honour to be to be introduced by you in such terms so th thank you for that uh, and I'm uh, can everyone hear me okay uh, am I audible Parker yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've, I've had a slight technical glitch with my my headset uh, earlier on today in some teaching uh, and I had some panicky messages from students in the chat room so if I do uh, if, if I do cut out again please just wave your arms or <laughs> mention something in the chat room so I know uh, to, to disconnect uh, I'm just going to share Mark, my. Mark, can I just quickly interrupt? We're, yeah. Just to say, we are recording this. So, if anyone objects to it being recorded, can you speak up now or forever hold your peace? You have uh, a few, a little bit of time just to say no. No one's saying no. That's great. Okay, we'll continue on. Thank Thanks, Parker. Uh, I'm going to put my slides up now, if that's all right. Uh, hopefully, the. Everyone see the first slide, okay? Uh, so, uh, also, I'm, I'm a Zoom person at UCL. We use Zoom, so this collaborates a little bit new to me. So, sorry if I've got a one or two teething problems. Uh, so, so thank you everybody for for tuning in today. It's it's lovely to be virtually present in Scotland's second finest city this evening. And uh, I. Uh, should confess, uh, my accent deceives me because uh, I am effectively an English lawyer, I'm ashamed to say, or at least I've been anglicised in my 
almost two decades since uh, since learning Scots law at Glasgow University. Uh, so apologies for some of my terminology. Uh, I, I may be offensively anglicised in some of the some of the terminology and concepts I use. I'll try not to be, but uh, Lady Wolf has already promised to pull me up on uh, on any over anglicisations and in, in my terminology. Uh, so uh, I uh, the the topic of today's paper was something that I hope would actually be a paper as such a written paper, but uh, with the chaos of the last couple of months and getting you know preparing for this new world of online teaching, what was supposed to be a paper is still an idea really, or hopefully something a little bit more than an idea. We're certainly not uh, at proper paper stage yet, which I apologise for. I hope you'll forgive me for. But uh, it does mean I get the benefit of all of your insights uh, before I move on. So uh, this is a topic which which really grabbed my interest uh, a few uh, a few uh, months ago. Actually, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, uh, my interest was first kind of grabbed by this topic a couple of years ago, long before COVID, when I had the pleasure of being second supervisor uh, at Cambridge University to a fabulous young scholar called Nareen Lalafarian, who has just authored a superb piece on this topic in the Journal of Corporate Law Studies uh, in the most recent edition, I believe. If you haven't read it, read it. It's absolutely brilliant. She's a really, really stellar uh, young commercial lawyer. And uh, it was Nareen's work that first got me interested in this topic. And then, of course, when COVID struck, uh, this became a really live issue. Uh, and uh, I was delighted to see that Nareen kind of struck at the right time and got the article out uh, when this is such a hot topic. So I'm kind of on her coattails in a way. Uh, and uh, then there were a couple of cases at the beginning of this year. I say cases, cases that never really actually made it to uh, made it to court, but ultimately didn't make it to judgment stage. So often happens with expensive, contentious commercial disputes. But they did get me thinking uh, about this particular to topic, an area of law which I think is still in a relatively underdeveloped state in some respects, but for understandable reasons, as I'll explain later. Uh, so there were there were a couple of cases. I apologise again for my foreignness, but uh, the two cases that really grabbed my interest, they weren't Scottish cases, they weren't English cases either. In fact, the Delaware cases uh, from the United States uh, the, the reason being that the, the companies involved were Delaware incorporated companies, which meant they were subject to Delaware law, as most US public companies are. The first case, and uh, sorry to get a bit racy so early in the evening with some lingerie, <laughs> but uh, this is widely known as the Victoria's Secret case, uh, which uh, kind of unfolded at the start of the year, uh, at the beginning of the COVID lockdown period. So uh, just to give you a bit of background, Sycamore Partners are a private equity firm, US-based private equity firm, and uh, they, uh, they were involved in negotiations with uh, what could best be called a conglomerate L brand, and Sycamore Partners wanted to buy the Victoria's Secret business from L brands, Victoria's Secret being a subsidiary of uh, L brands group, L brands being the parent holding company. Uh, then on 20th of February of this year, uh, Sycamore Partners agreed. They, 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 they finally struck a deal, uh, effectively a share purchase agreement. Sycamore Partners agreed to purchase a majority equity stake in Victoria's Secret from L Brands uh, for just over half a billion dollars, $525 million. Uh, and closure of the transaction. So essentially the date when uh, Sycamore Partners had to come up with the money and, and actually buy the shares. The closure date was set, uh, or the closure period was, it wasn't set as such, but it was scheduled for the second quarter of 2020. So sometime between April and June. But can you guess what happened between mid-February and April 2020? I think we all know. So in a way, you couldn't have picked a worse time for the completion of this agreement. It was just before uh, the COVID lockdown uh, in, in, in 
most parts of the world, I think. Uh, I know in East Asia, it was obviously locked down before that date, I believe, if I remember rightly. But certainly in, in uh, Northern Europe, I would guess, in the UK and also in the US, uh, this was just imminently before the, the main lockdown measures came into play. So March 2020, uh, like so many retail businesses, uh, L Brands were compelled to close almost all Victoria's Secret retail stores worldwide and uh, either laid off or put on furlough uh, most Victoria's Secret staff to the extent that there were furlough schemes available in the relevant jurisdictions, relevant countries. Uh, so all that happened in March, early April, and then on the 22nd of April, uh, Sycamore Partners decided, well, this deal hasn't really worked out the way that we had hoped. And uh, they announced that they were essentially walking away or, as I've said in the title of the presentation, wriggling out, which I think to me actually, I know it's a bit of a normatively loaded term, but to me it sums up what's really going on here. Uh, Sycamore Partners enters a deal, seems like a very attractive deal. There's a significant change in circumstances after the, the share purchase agreement is entered into. And what initially seemed like a really good deal, all of a sudden becomes a catastrophically bad deal. So 22nd of April, uh, Sycamore Partners, the, the, the putative purchaser, announced that it was terminating the acquisition agreement. It was walking away. And to justify their stance, uh, they cited non-satisfaction of conditions precedent to deal closure. Uh, and uh, they, they immediately sought a declaratory judgment from the Delaware Court of Chancery to basically confirm that uh, their decision to walk away was, was, was valid, was legally justified. And uh, Sycamore Partners said a number of things in their submissions to the Delaware Court. Uh, one statement I think stood out above all, uh, the, the second last statement on that slide, uh, that these actions were taken as a result of or in response to the COVID-19 pandemic is no defence to L Brand's clear breaches of the transaction agreement. What those breaches are, we'll talk about in a minute when we actually look at the law. But essentially what they were saying is there's been a major change in the state of play here and we know that COVID has been a precipitating factor indeed has been the precipitating factor, but ultimately that's no excuse uh, because uh, the, 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 the goalposts have been shifted by the vendor here, uh, given the, the, the measures they've taken over the last few weeks, albeit in response to this crisis. Now, in the end, the case ultimately didn't go to, to judgment because the parties agreed out of court settlement. And when I say a settlement, it wasn't really a settlement because essentially Sycamore Partners won because uh, L Brands voluntarily allowed them to walk away. So they mutually terminated the deal. And in the end, it, it never proceeded in court. So Sycamore Partners got their way. They played hardball and ultimately they got their way here. And the deal never went ahead. And there have been actually quite a few cases like this. Uh, not just in the US, in the UK as well, to some extent. Uh, the one of the most well, one of the most notable cases in the UK was Moss Brothers, the, the gents clothing store. They were involved in a similar dispute, uh, but ultimately, I believe that settled, or uh, it was not settled, it was resolved uh, uh, in, in in an out of court way. Uh, the other case, and this is the one that's really been grabbing the headlines internationally. It's another, it's another Delaware case. Because uh, it involves a US public, a, a, a US uh, listed and Delaware registered company, uh, Tiffany, uh, who we all know is the the, the high end luxury jewellery brand. Uh, and this has actually been in the FT this morning. There's been very recent developments in uh, in, in in this episode, and it's just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, these are value judgments, but. To me, and speaking not as a with a scholarly hat on, just speaking as somebody who follows market developments, intuitively there just seems something a bit distasteful, a bit distasteful about what's going on in this case. But again, that's that's subjective opinion. Uh, so uh, basically, 
uh, Tiffany, the 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 high end jewellery store, uh, were aggressively courted. I think it's fair to say by LVMH, uh, which is essentially the LV stands for Louis Vuitton. Uh, they are a a, a luxury brand conglomerate, I think is probably the best way to describe them. Uh, their CEO is this gentleman in the slide, Bernard Arnold, who is intermittently on and off, I believe, the richest human being on the planet. Uh, and I think it's fair to say is generally used to get in his way uh, with, uh, with many things. And uh, LVMH, uh, Bernard Arnold's uh, company, uh, they wanted to buy Tiffany. As I say, they aggressively courted them to the extent that they even increased their bid price back last year in 2019. They increased their bid price three times in the one day, so desperate they were to acquire Tiffany. They had courted them for a long time. They had been uh, also, I think it's fair to say, for want of a better word, they had also courted US government and the Trump administration, including actually building a new Tiffany's production plant in Texas as a way of hopefully finding favor with the domestic authorities in the US. So eventually, Tiffany accepted their offer. The offer they accepted was $135 per share in cash. Uh, the merger agreement was entered into uh, on the 25th of November last year. The overall deal value was 16 billion dollars so a really big deal i think by anyone's standards then of course we know what happened covid struck lockdowns began and on the 18th of march tiffany share price had slumped to a low of 111 dollars so again what 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 initially seems like an attractive deal becomes very unattractive and then after aggressively trying to acquire Tiffany for the last few months, uh, LVMH uh, then ra rapidly change course and then do absolutely everything that they can possibly think of to try and not <laughs> acquire Tiffany <laughs> uh, and uh, completely go in the opposite direction. And then in September, 7th of September this year, uh, so just last month, LVMH formally announced it was terminating the merger agreement. It was walking away or wriggling out, citing material adverse change in the jeweler's condition after COVID as a valid basis for termination. Uh, Tiffany filed suit two days later in the Delaware Chancery Court. Uh, the alleged breach of contract, obviously, for not uh, proceeding with the uh, completion of the merger agreement and they sought an order from the Delaware court compelling specific performance of the agreement so basically demanding that uh, the agreement was completed and the shares were acquired uh, on the 21st of September so just a few weeks ago the Delaware Chancery Court unusually agreed to expedite the trial to put it forward to the 5th of January uh, and then this morning it was reported in the financial press that Tiffany have now agreed to enter into further negotiations with LVMH with a view to reducing the merger price. And one can conjecture that ultimately this is what LVMH wanted all along. Neither party really wanted to go to trial in January. So LVMH has really got what it wanted. It's used the legal process to strong arm Tiffany into reducing the agreed merger price. And at the moment, it looks like Tiffany may well succumb to that demand, but obviously watch this space to see how it turns out. But as things stand, I would be quite surprised if these parties are in Wilmington on the 5th of January. I don't think I don't think this is going to make it all the way. It looks like there will be a, 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 I say a settlement. Again, is it really a settlement? Effectively, what's happening is LVMH are going to get their way, I think. Uh, and are going to be able to buy Tiffany's at a lower price than the agreed price. So that's just a bit of background. That's why I've, I've been interested in this topic. That's the background. Now to turn to the, the law. And I mean, one, I'm, I am going to make a, a, a disclaimer here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a 
I'm, I'm acutely sensitive to the fact that even though I've taught corporate law for a very long time, I've, I've never actually worked as a solicitor. I haven't worked in legal practice, which I'm why I'm so glad that there's quite a few very good legal practitioners here this evening. So one of the things I'm very keen to do is actually to get input from legal practitioners uh, who, who, who do these deals, who are involved in transactions of this nature. Uh, and that's why Johnny's uh, Johnny is an ex-solicitor, why his views on this, I think, will be very valuable for me. Uh, I'm also delighted my colleague, Professor Graham Penn at UCL, who's uh, a partner at Sidley Austin, has also agreed to help me with this project. So uh, what you see just now is kind of my academic prototype. <laughs> but uh, hopefully uh, there will be more practitioner content coming in to give it another dimension. But as I understand it, and I do, I'm open to correction here, because uh, this is a learning experience for me, but what legal doctrines could apply? And I think if we were if we were presenting these cases in a an undergraduate contract law uh, lecture or tutorial, whether in England or in Scotland, I would imagine, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the first thing we would probably think of is frustration of contract. Has the contract been frustrated? In which case, the buyer in each case would be entitled to walk away. Is COVID a frustrating event? Uh, secondly, if we're not dealing with frustration, then surely we're dealing with force majeure, some sort of act of God. Every transaction worth its salt will have some sort of force majeure clause in it, that surely could be invoked. Thirdly, uh, a now very vogue term, uh, material adverse change or material adverse uh, event, as it's known in the US, a MAC or MAE clause, uh, which uh, would, would would conceivably kick in in these situations as well, and indeed did kick in in, in the affected cases. And fourthly, something which uh, ultimately turned out to be the crux in the, uh, the Victoria's Secret case, which was something called an ordinary course clause. Uh, or, or at least it would have been the crux had the case ultimately proceeded to, to trial or, or at least summary judgment. So, I mean, the, the one that will probably have most, be of most interest to, 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 to academic private lawyers will be good old frustration of contract, uh, which students love, or at least in my experience, students love this topic. And I'm sorry, my writing on this slide is really small, uh, but... Uh, I think most of us are familiar on uh, some level with this with this doctrine. So where a, an unforeseen or unforeseeable event occurs after the contract has been entered into, which is neither party's fault and either renders performance of the contract impossible or at least radically different from how it was first envisaged, then and only then will the contract be regarded as frustration with the effect that the parties are essentially discharged from their respective obligations uh, and therefore will not be called upon to perform any further obligations under the contract. Uh, and the picture is the, the Surrey Music Hall and Gardens uh, from, I don't, I, I don't know if this case is discussed much north of the border, but certainly south of the border. Uh, the first case uh, that we we think of in uh, when we think of frustration of contract is Taylor and Caldwell, uh, where the the rather wealthy, uh, rather wealthy customer hires the Surrey Music Hall and Gardens for a very elaborate party, and uh, after after agreeing to hire the 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 hall, uh, the hall is destroyed by fire, and then there's a question: Well, where do losses lie? And the English court's view was that, well, the contract's been frustrated because there's been a radical change in the nature of the obligations under the contract. Uh, therefore, uh, parties are discharged and the whole doesn't have to be paid for. So losses essentially lie with the vendor of the service rather than the purchaser. Uh, now, in, 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 in the succeeding years since 1863, uh, the, 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 the duty has been, the, the doctrine has been narrowed down quite considerably, most notably in the, the English case of contractors and Fairham, where it was provided that uh, where there's a significant change in the context of the contract, in the market context of the contract, after the contract's been entered into, 
but the effect ultimately is simply to make performance more onerous or less advantageous for one of the parties. That will not be frustration. So, for example, Davis and Ferrum, many people will be familiar with this case, case of a building firm that undertook to, 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 to do a major construction project for a client. After agreeing to do the work, there was a change in the, the, the market. Labour became a lot more expensive. Raw materials became a lot more expensive. It then meant that what was seemingly a profitable deal originally all of a sudden became a loss-making project for the builders. The builders argued frustration, and the court said, no, that's not frustration. That's just a disadvantageous change of circumstances. Uh, but uh, you know, if we held frustration in this case, all we would be doing is relieving the builders from the consequences of a bad bargain. And as we know, that's not something that the courts, certainly not, certainly English courts, have been very, very adamant they do not want to do. Uh, so, and, and of course, frustration will not apply in any case where a party's inability to perform is due in part to their own prior commercial decisions, which actually brings up quite an interesting question about lockdown measures. Lockdown measures were government imposed, so I don't think we could regard them as commercial decisions. Uh, but uh, it is a, a, another interesting element or restriction to that doctrine. So, moving forward, uh, speed up a bit. Uh, uh, just, just on this point, would COVID be regarded as a frustrating event? I mean, I guess to a large extent it may depend on the, the nature and the context of the contract in question. In relation to M&A contracts, like the ones we've been looking at, or share purchase agreements, and, and I'm, I, I'd love to hear your opinions. Personally, I don't think it would be, because in cases of the nature of the ones we've been discussing, the consequence of COVID-19 is not to substantially change the nature of the obligations under the contract. Both the buyers in both cases still have the same obligation, is to buy the target company or to buy shares they've undertook to buy. The obligation is exactly the same. They're getting what they paid for, like was always intended. The only outcome is it's no longer advantageous for them. So all these COVID-related M&A and share purchase agreement cases like Toria Secret and uh, and the, the Tiffany's case. To me, if those cases were English law cases, and again, I'll, 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 I'll await opinion on Scots law, but certainly if they were English law cases, I don't ever, I wouldn't see an English court allowing a buyer to walk away. To me, that's a bad bargain. It's not frustration. This is a Davis and Fareham case, not a Taylor and Caldwell case, at least in my reading. But anyhow, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to see frustration come before a court for the simple reason that any sophisticated commercial parties with half-decent lawyers are going to have made their own contractual provision. And where the parties have made their own contractual provision against a potential adverse event, then by definition, the event was foreseen and was foreseeable otherwise the parties wouldn't have contracted around it. So where there's something like a force majeure clause in the contract, it's almost impossible, very, very hard to argue frustration because you've effectively admitted implicitly that, well, you could foresee this event and that's why you got your lawyers to contract around it or to contract against it. Now, we could be dealing with force majeure. Uh, obviously, force majeure clauses come in many different forms. Uh, I mean, as a, as a kind of crude example, I've extracted this from the Lexus PSL database, uh, which is their, their up-to-date example of a force majeure clause. And uh, this, this just uh, provides for what happens if there is an act of God, if there is a force majeure. Now, what's problematic from the point of view of the cases I've been looking at is what a force majeure clause essentially does is it it provides that a party shall not be liable to the extent it shall not be liable but liable for breach of contract to the extent that it is delayed or prevented from performing its obligations under the agreement. But the problem is in all these cases, the parties were not prevented from performing their obligations. They still could perform their obligations. They still could complete the deal. The point was they didn't want to because it was no longer advantageous to do it. So that's why, uh, and I mean, we, we look at the definition of what force majeure is, and I'm sorry for the tiny writing, but if you can, can maximise and maybe discern the red type 
the standard force majeure clause, uh, and, and by standard I've taken the Lexus PSL example, does include reference to epidemics or pandemics as an act of God, and also law or government orders, rules, regulations or directions, including, I would therefore guess, a mandatory lockdown regulations. So within the definition of force majeure, at least this definition, it would seem that COVID and COVID lockdown is covered within the meaning. The problem isn't so much the definition of force majeure. The problem is the specified legal consequences, which is, is which is that, or not so much the specified legal consequences, but the situation force majeure would apply in, which would be where a party is unable to perform their obligations under the contract, which is just not the case. In these wriggle out cases that I've been discussing, that's not the case. Uh, so ultimately in these cases, uh, it, they came down to frustration wouldn't kick in in a case like that because contractual provision has been made. Force majeure probably won't be that useful because it doesn't actually provide a basis for wriggling out of an obligation that can otherwise be performed, albeit disadvantageously. Which leaves us possibly with this option, material adverse change. Now, any sophisticated commercial agreement, and the practitioners can correct me if I'm wrong, but any sophisticated commercial agreement worth its salt will have some variant today of a, of a material adverse change, a MAC clause in it. Uh, and uh, especially uh, m and agreements, merger and acquisition agreements, share purchase agreements, and also debt financing agreements in particular will we'll, we'll most likely have a MAC clause, at least if the lawyers have been doing the work they're, they're paid to do. Uh, so they're very common in these types of transactions, especially. A typical MAC clause will define what is meant by a material adverse event, and the material adverse event clause will then be linked to a complementary event of default clause, which means that if a defined material adverse event occurs, it automatically activates an event of default, it automatically constitutes an event of default, which in turn gives the victim, so to speak, the right to walk away and basically terminate the contract. And MACs can come in different forms. You can have a business MAC, which covers firm-specific events, uh, so, if it was a, 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 an airline, or, or, or you know, if it was an airline, it could be something to do with closure of you know, regulations preventing flights, or whatever. Uh, or it could be a market mark, so a mark that affect that, that that concerns an adverse market development generally. So, I guess if we're talking about COVID nineteen and related lockdown measures, obviously that would. That would constitute a market mark rather than a business mark. I know, admittedly, lockdown and COVID affect some businesses much more than others. Tech businesses seem to have done relatively well out of COVID. Retail businesses, not so well. But nonetheless, I think most of us would probably still regard COVID as being more macro than micro in nature. And therefore, you would see it as a market material adverse change. Now, what constitutes a mark? Well, it's quite interesting to contrast. Uh, force majeure clauses and MAC clauses. It's typically with a force majeure clause, at least in my understanding, you get a kind of encyclopedic definition of every possible bad thing that could ever happen in the world. <laughs> Throwing everything plus the kitchen sink into the clause to try and expressly cover the contingency that you fear may result. So essentially the lawyers are looking into their crystal ball and trying to anticipate all these terrible things that might happen that could upset the contract. Whereas a MAC is very different. With a MAC, there's typically no real specificity at all. MAC clauses are typically diffuse. The wording tends to be rather open-ended. And uh, also, there has been notably little case law on the interpretation of MAC clauses. Uh, there have been quite a few Delaware cases uh, but uh, certainly in uh, in England, uh, there's only one really big case of note, uh, Grupo Hotelero, Mr Justice Blair's decision back in, I think, 2013, 
another couple of smaller decisions. But to be honest, even in the Grupo Hotelero case, which concerned a, a debt financing uh, arrangement, uh, even in that case, even though it was an enormous judgment, uh, which ran into hundreds of, uh, of pages, I think, as far as I can remember, there was actually very little law in it. Most of it was just factual analysis. There was very little analysis of the, the legal authorities, because basically there's not really many at all. Now, why is this? Uh, well, I think there's a reason. Uh, sorry, go back to my previous slide. There's a reason that MAC clauses are open-ended in their wording. And this is where uh, the scholar I mentioned earlier, uh, Nareen Lalafarian's recent work is really valuable because Nareen has identified that uh, MAC clauses in practice aren't intended to be enforced by and large. People who use material adverse change clauses and use wording of this nature. So, so if we look at the wording here, the, the, the top point in the slide, this is a Lexus PSL example again of a MAC clause. Uh, a material adverse change means any change, event, circumstance or effect occurring before completion individually are taken in the aggregate is or is reasonably likely to be material adverse to the business operations, assets, position, liabilities, profits or prospects of the company. So really it's that this is a pretty open-ended definition. Uh, as Johnny pointed out actually in a comment he made to me before and I'm sure I don't want to preempt his comments but Johnny did uh, flag up something that I didn't mention in this slide, which is you can get subjective and objective MAC clauses. An objective MAC clause uh, will, will, will define the material adverse event in terms of a factual event, an objective factual occurrence, whereas a subjective MAC clause will define the material event in terms of, well, was it something that was reasonably believed to be a material adverse event? Uh, usually from the point of view of the person who's seeking to invoke the MAC clause, which obviously gives a bit more leeway to the party that's relying on the clause. But uh, maybe Johnny might say a little bit more about that in a moment. So MAC clauses do have an open-ended wording. I think there's a couple of reasons for this, a couple of reasons as to why they've not been tightened up more. So one reason is uh, that uh, parties just want to get the deal done. And my, my former Cambridge colleague, Richard Hooley, wrote a, a, superb, a su superb article, I think it was a book chapter actually, called Mac Clauses After 9-11, back just after the 9-11 tragedy, when a lot of Mac Clauses were being invoked in the US. And Richard made a really important point and said, well, the lawyers in these transactions are under pressure to get the deal done. The, 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 Realistically speaking, they're not in a position to quibble for too long over what do we understand as a MAC, what do you understand as a material adverse event, what do we understand as a material adverse event, can we come to a compromise? There's, there's pressure from the clients to get the deal done uh, in real time, and ultimately the lawyers have to say, well, look, this isn't perfect, but uh, we'll just we'll leave it as it is. And will deal with those problems as they arise in real time. Then, of course, what happens is when a, when there's a suspected material, material adverse event, the party that's seeking to rely on the clause can then say, look, I think there's been a material adverse event. Now, we could take this to court. It will be long. It'll be, it'll be expensive. And if we win, we'll get to pull out of the contract. Or you could just agree to vary your terms in our favour a little bit. And as, as, as Nareen's excellent JCLS article identifies, this is the main value of MAC clauses. They're not really intended to be, which is another reason as to why I think they can be kept open worded. They're not really intended to be directly enforced in most cases. They have an indirect or reflexive effect. They give bargaining leverage to one of the parties in certain situations. Uh, and it's hoped that they'll get their way without having to go to court, which, of course, is exactly what's happened in both the Tiffany's and the Victoria's Secret cases, albeit in Delaware. But the same principle applies. I mean, I don't think there's any radical difference in the way these clauses are worded uh, in Delaware as compared to, uh, to England or Scotland. Now, uh, this is, however, 
in the in the Victoria Secret case, the uh, the Mac clause which the buyers, Sycamore Partners, tried to rely on, ultimately couldn't actually be invoked for the simple reason that it expressly include it expressly excluded pandemics. So a pandemic was expressly excluded from the list of things that possibly constitute a material adverse event. So if you were L Brands, the vendors, you would probably be giving your lawyers a, 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 a great big pat on the back and a nice expensive bottle of whiskey. <laughs> if you were Sycamore Partners lawyers, then you would probably, I'm guessing, be wanting to drop them from a great height for, uh, for allowing this one to slip through. The pandemics were excluded, which meant Sycamore Partners wouldn't have been able to rely on the MAC clause had this case gone to, to, to trial or at least summary judgment, which therefore meant they had to fall back on this backup provision which they had in the contract, which is something called an ordinary course clause. And this basically provides, it's, it's essentially an undertaking that the vendor gives uh, in the, the sale purchase agreement. Uh, the vendor undertakes uh, that it, it shall cause its subsidiaries to conduct their business in the ordinary course consistent past practice. And ultimately, this was the clause that Sycamore Brands invoked. Uh, and they argued, look, Victoria's Secret have closed down almost all their shops. They've laid, all, they've laid off or furloughed almost all their staff. And therefore, there's been a change to the ordinary course in which the business had previously been run. Therefore, they're in breach of this provision. It's a condition precedent to deal closure. So the fact this condition has not been satisfied entitles us to walk away. And essentially, that was their main argument. Now, of course, the natural counter argument to that is to say, well, yes, uh, L Brands changed the natural course, the ordinary course of Victoria's Secret business. But they were dealing with a catastrophic global pandemic, public health catastrophe and also in many of the countries in which they traded there were mandatory lockdown measures in force that affected retailers so how can that be an, how, how how can we be in breach of the ordinary course when actually we were just responding to an a, 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 a emergency situation now of course we will never know how a court would have decided that point well we may ultimately know how a course decides a point of this nature We'll never know the outcome to this particular dispute because, as we know, ultimately uh, L Brands agreed to back down and they agreed to allow uh, Sycamore Partners to wriggle out. So the case never ultimately went to uh, to, to judgment. Uh, so I've already distinguished force majeure and, and MAC clauses. I think I can skip by that. How should MAC clauses be interpreted? Well, this is when I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on, on England and I apologise for the the anglicised authority and terminology, but uh, when we interpret any sort of clause in a, in a commercial or other contract, the accepted approach, at least since uh, uh, f for the last two, 20, 25 years, has been Lord Hoffman's well-known factual matrix approach. So basically, you take a, an objective, contextual, commercially common sense interpretation of the term, having regard to all the relevant circumstances that existed at the time the relevant contract was entered into. Uh, and you don't get too hung up on the literal wording of the term. That's essentially the test that would be employed. And in fact, it's, it's, it's one of these doctrines, it's very hard to find anybody who would disagree with it because uh, ostensibly it seems to make perfect sense. You know, from a commercial point of view, why would we not take a, a commercially expedient, common sense, contextual interpretation. Uh, now, with respect to the particular clauses that we're looking at, I'm going to argue against that proposition in a moment, and I will keep it really short because I know I'm at the end of my time now. Uh, but one thing that some people might be thinking about, some of the commercial lawyers in the audience might be thinking is, well, what about the unfair contract terms? That? Uh, what about Section 3 of UCTA? which of course provides that if there's a exclusion or limitation clause which seeks to exclude or limit a contractor's liability for breach of contract, 
then it, that will be deemed invalid to the extent that it fails to satisfy the statutory reasonableness test in Section 11 of UCTA. So could this be viewed as an unreasonable exemption clause in respect of breach of contract liability if there's a, a MAC or ordinary course clause of this nature? Because that ultimately seems to be its effect. But I think the safe answer to that question is no. And uh, another former colleague of mine, uh, Rafael Zakrovsky, I think has, has clarified this issue very nicely in, a, in an article he wrote around 10 years ago. Uh, Rafael said, notes that Section 3 is unlikely to apply to, to, to any clauses of this nature, given that the commercial agreements which they form part of are typically not on standard form terms, because we know UCTA applies to standard form contract entered into between businesses. Uh, these agreements are typically negotiated reciprocally. Now, there may be a degree of bargaining power disparity, not so much in M&A agreements, but certainly in debt financing agreements, there may often be bargaining disparity in favour of the lender. However, they are still reciprocally negotiated business to business contracts. And uh, as a result, and, and, and there usually isn't gross bargaining disparity in the sense that we might see in a consumer contract. Therefore, I think it's unlikely that Section 3 would apply to these cases. So I don't see these as being unfair contract terms cases, unless anybody can think of a compelling reason as to why they would be. So my argument, and my really, really un unfashionable argument, is maybe we should kind of go back to the future here. Uh, I, I mean, I'm kind of putting my, my colours on the table here, uh, and uh, in many ways this is a very normatively loaded presentation, uh, which 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 uh, I don't like, and I do admit that. But uh, I mean, I, I I've always been schooled to believe that as a general maxim, you cannot wriggle out of a bargain unless you've been the victim of fraud or duress or some extreme form of unconscionability or undue influence. And you cannot wriggle out of a bad bargain just because the world has turned against you and made what seemed like a good contract a pretty, unfortunately, bad one. Uh, and uh, this is why I would argue that rather than taking Lord Hoffman's objective, common sense, factual matrix approach, to interpreting these sorts of terms. Maybe should maybe there is a case for being a little more literal and small c conservative in the way that courts interpret these terms. And the contra proferentum rule, which again many of you will be familiar with, is essentially a very, very old maxim that words of deeds, in Edward Coke's words, the words of deeds are to be taken more strongly against those who put them forward. So if you're seeking to rely on a clause, in particular an exemption clause of some, of some nature, the traditional common law rule would be that the term is construed against the party seeking to rely on it. So classic English case of contra proferentum would be a case like uh, Alderslade, uh, and, and Alderslade and Hendon Laundry, where uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an exemption clause on the wall of the laundrette shop back in the 1950s or 1960s, saying that we are not liable for damage to any property left in these in this facility. Uh, ultimately, uh, there's uh, the, as a result of the negligence of the owner of the laundry, uh, the, 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 the property of one of the customers that's been left overnight is stolen, and the laundry tries to invoke the exemption clause the exemption clause basically says we will not be liable for any loss or damage to, uh, to, to customer property left on the premises. Despite having that clause, uh, the, the Hendon Laundry lost the case because basically they had not went, mentioned expressly the word negligence in their, in their term. Therefore, because there was a slight hint of ambiguity in the term, the term was construed biasedly against them. Uh, and in favour of the customer. Now, my argument, and, and although uh, the uh, contra proferentum rule has gone out of fashion, particularly with the Unfair Contract Terms Act in 1977, and more recently the Consumer Rights Act 2015, 
largely taken over a lot of the business of dealing with imbalanced, unfair contracts. It's not so much space for the contra proferentum rule now. Uh, however, on an academic level, uh, Joanna McConnell from Bristol University in a CLP lecture, uh, no, it wasn't a CLP lecture, sorry, it was a, uh, an OGLS, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies article she wrote last year, brilliant article. She provides a very compelling case as to why there's still a public policy rationale for using the contra proferentum rule today. And I actually think in these cases, the ones we've been looking at, there's a particularly compelling public policy rationale uh, for, for using the contra proferentum principle. So essentially what we would be saying is that unless a, a MAC clause or an ordinary course clause makes specific express reference to a public health pandemic, we would not be able to use the MAC clause to, 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 to allow them to wriggle out of the contract in such a scenario. Because there's a degree of ambiguity, we resolve that ambiguity against the party that's seeking to rely on the MAC clause, and therefore we hold them to the deal and we stop them from walking away from a bad bargain. Now, admittedly, MAC clauses are usually used specifically uh, in relation to exemption clauses, exclusion clauses, or limitation clauses, but there's no obvious doctrinal reason I can see, at least in the English common law, for restricting uh, uh, the contra proferentum rule just to that context. And uh, I'd be keen to hear a Scottish perspective on that, if there, if there is one. So final slide. I believe there is a public policy case for resurrecting the contra proferentum rule today in relation to these contractual wriggle out attempts. Why? Well, we are living in an increasingly risk sensitive, interconnected commercial world. The knock on effects of a major, not just a major public health catastrophe like the COVID 19 pandemic. There's also potentially huge global knock-on effects of uh, other comparably serious uh, pandemics, if I can use that word, not just of a public health nature, but of an environmental, sorry, of an environmental or ecological nature, uh, or uh, global catastrophes, for example, of a technological nature, which could quite conceivably occur. Uh, so. I think we are living in a world where more likely than not we will face another systemic catastrophe, a global systemic catastrophe in the nature of COVID-19. It may not be, be, be of a public health nature, it may be ecological, it may be technological, but ultimately in an interconnected world, these are risks that we all live under. Commercial agreements will be liable to be upset on a broad scale. By events of this nature. So contract law is an element of private law. Contract law principally exists to give effect to the parties' agreement. But as many scholars, most notably Hugh Collins at LSE, have, have, have noted, uh, contract law is also a regulating instrument. It has a, regula a regulatory function. It has, for want of a better word, a public function, even though not all private lawyers might be comfortable admitting that. Uh, now, if we're looking for a public policy, well, as my another colleague of mine, Paul Davies, uh, argued very cogently in his CLP lecture at UCL earlier this year, contracting parties should not be at liberty to escape the adverse consequences of bad bargains. That maxim, at least of English law, stands as firm today, I think, as it has in the past. Yes, there's exceptions for consumer contracts or contracts where there's extreme instances of unconscionability or undue influence. But other than those exceptional cases, parties still should be held to the consequence of bad bargains. The old Smith and Hughes principle in English law certainly still stands firm. And also there's public policy reasons for upholding legal certainty in commercial transactions. If we're dealing with things like, for example, M&A agreements, share purchase agreements, or alternatively, debt financing agreements, they typically do not stand in isolation. A large-scale debt financing agreement will almost certainly be linked to a construction project or another major investment project. 
that, that, that it's being used to finance, which will in turn be linked to lots of contracts. So there is a potential domino effect if one of those contracts falls away because one of the parties wriggles out. And there's also negative externalities as well. If we look at, for example, scuppered M&A transactions, potentially we could be dealing with a corporate restructuring. It's essential to save the business and prevent it descending into administration or liquidation, in which case we could have insolvency and unemployment risk arising as well. So in conclusion, a contra, the con, resurrection of the contra proferentum rule would be justified as a, effectively as, as a, a new or rather old precautionary principle for contract law in a post-COVID economic world. In environmental law, lawyers commonly talk about the, the idea of a precautionary principle, the idea that we should show caution towards certain innovations unless we are absolutely clear that they will not have a material adverse environmental effect. Actually, my argument would be, my tentative argument would be, maybe we should consider a precautionary principle in contract law, where we, where basically if a party is using a, a cleverly drafted clause to escape the consequences of their obligations under an agreement, unless they are absolutely express and crystal clear about the circumstances where they can invoke that clause, they should not be allowed to use it in the interest of preventing the risk of broader knock-on effects, especially in a, in a catastrophic pandemic situation like the one that uh, we've, we've found ourselves in this year. So that's my 10 pence worth. Uh, I'm now going to let Johnny and Sarah possibly tear this apart. But uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, well, it's an apt time, I think, to say stay safe and well. For the, the continuation of this weird period we're living in. So, th thank you, everybody.